Um, first, to get things kicked off today, I want to give you a little bit of context that will help us have a bit of perspective uh, that will bring this teaching to life in the book of Philippians. And feel free, there's sermon notes in your bulletins. If you would like to make notes, jot stuff down, it's a good place to do it. Um, if you've got a, an iPhone or a Bible or an iPad, feel free to pull that out. We're going to be in Philippians 1 pretty exclusively this morning. Uh, and the book of Philippians, if you're not familiar with it, was actually a, a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. Now, now Paul was the one who started that church, okay? He had had some previous contact with them. He had went and lived with them and worked among them. And if you know Paul, Paul was a, an itinerant church starter and evangelist and teacher, and so he was moving all around the Mediterranean. Uh, but this was among the stops that he had made over the years to start a church in that area. And so Paul is writing a, a letter back to them. And, and Paul, if you're not familiar with the Apostle Paul, he's this, he's this apostle who was sent out by God specifically um, to reach primarily to the non-Jews. And so his task is go reach the Gentiles. Go, go reach those who are not ethnically Jewish. And, and that's where he really gets his traction. And so Paul does that. He raises up leaders. He starts churches in a bunch of different cities. Um, and, and this church, as I was saying, the Philippi church is a church he starts in about 52 AD. So about, give or take, uh, 20 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this particular church has a, a special place in Paul's heart. He, he's passionate for them. He has a deep affection for these people in this church at Philippi. And you'll see that kind of ooze out in the weeks to come as we study this book. Now, at the time that he's writing this letter, this letter's written about 10 years after he had been there and started this church. So we're talking, give or take, 62 A.D., uh, and he's writing this letter in response to something that the Philippian church did for him. Paul was actually in a time of, of dire need, frankly. Um, he had some significant need and just, he basically couldn't make, me, make ends meet. He couldn't pay the bills. He was, he was struggling to finance the ministries that he was running. Okay, And so this church takes up a generous love offering and they send it to him. Now, normally, the Apostle Paul wouldn't take money from people. Paul didn't want to have anybody have financial leverage over him. He didn't want anybody to be able to say, you know, you're just saying this because we paid you to say this kind of thing. He didn't want, he didn't want anybody to have influence over him. He wanted no strings attached. I'm going to preach the gospel with both guns blazing, right? That's, that's who Paul was. And so, he, he was a tent maker. He would go and he would work on his own. He was bivocational. He would, he would work in the morning building tents and then and teach and preach all evening and all afternoon and, and do things like that so that he would have absolute freedom from having any association, any, anybody making inferences as to his motivation for preaching the gospel. And so he didn't normally take money from people. But because of his unique relationship with this church... <laughs> He accepts this blessing, and in fact, he's blown away by their generosity uh, that when they send it to him, he's just, well, this is more than I could have ever imagined, that they help him meet his need. And so he writes this heartfelt, this emotional thank you letter uh, back to the church, and then among it, as we will see, he mingles some gentle and, and loving instruction, maybe even a little bit of correction to them to keep them walking down the right path spiritually. Now I want you to, to notice as we look at the high points of the book of Philippians that there's an unmistakable theme as we look at it. This theme kind of rises to the top, kind of like the cream rising to the top, right? This theme that comes oozing out of the book of Philippians is the theme of joy. In fact, you're going to see joy or hear the word rejoice an enormous amount in this week and the weeks to come. Um, Paul uses it 19 different times in the book of Philippians. And you're going to see this massive joy just come out of a guy who may not at that time, frankly, in that season of his life and ministry, had a whole lot of reasons to be all that joyful, right? And if you know Paul, you know Paul had both the highs and lows of ministry. All, all who minister have that roller coaster ride, but man, Paul. Paul rode the big roller coaster. He wasn't on the kitty roller coaster, right? Paul, Paul had the highs where thousands of people were coming to Christ. And Paul had the lows where he was 
whipped, where he was beaten, where he was jailed, where he was chained, as we're going to see today, chained to another man, a jailer, his freedom taken away because he loved Jesus. So Paul knew the ebbs and flows, the ups and downs. But here's the amazing thing. Paul writes this joy-filled letter nonetheless. And we know from elsewhere in Scripture that, that at this time that Paul's writing this letter is, is in one of those times of captivity. And in fact, he spends two whole years under house arrest for simply preaching the gospel, for doing what I'm doing right now. They lock him up for two years. They take away his freedom for two years. They say, Paul, you can't go to the next town and preach. Paul, you can't go start the next church. Paul, you can't go teach more believers. Paul, you're going to be locked up here for two years. Well, they didn't tell him that, but that's what happened, right? Now, if you can imagine, for two years, Paul is literally chained up 24 hours a day, chained to a Roman soldier, right? How would you feel about that? My, my dad runs a prison in South Dakota. You know, they don't get to put people in chains. You know, you, you would, in yourself, if you were one of the prison guards or one of the officials like my father, you put somebody in chains, other than as they're walking in and out of the building for safety, you put them in chains, you're going to probably end up going to jail because of it, okay? So you don't get to do that anymore. But Paul is literally chained to another man 24 hours a day. Now, if you know Paul, Paul's greatest dream was always to take the gospel to Rome, Right? He always wanted to go to Rome as a preacher, but instead, he ends up having to go to Rome as a prisoner. And so we're going to watch how, with a change of perspective, even in the middle of this significant trial of his life, God can give him, as well as us, great joy in the midst of what may seem like uncertain or even negative circumstances. God can give us joy no matter what, no matter where we are. So let's dig in there today. We're going to start in Philippians 1-2, if you're following along. And, and I'm just praying that God will give us all a, a new perspective from this. Now Paul writes this to his beloved church. He says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, now listen to Paul's emotion in this next segment. He says, I thank God... Every time that I remember you, in all of my prayers, for all of you, I always pray with joy, right? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this. Now watch him here. He encourages the people in the church of Philippi. He says that he, God, who began a good work in you, will carry it on through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then in verse 7, if you skip down a little bit, it says, it says this. It says, It is right for me to feel this way about you, since I have you in my heart, he says, for whether I am in chains, or if I'm a, a prisoner, or defending, or confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. And there you see him saying, Hey, even if I'm in chains, folks, even if I'm in chains, God is still good. And, and he knows as he's saying this, this is the introduction to his letter, right? He's, he's saying, even if I'm in chains, which is, which is telling them, it's kind of like code speak, hey folks, I'm in chains, right? I, I'm, I'm, I don't have my freedom right now, is what he's telling them. And he knows as he says this, these, these friends, these, these people he's been close to, they're going to be worried about Paul, Right? If you hear one of your friends is in jail, you got friends like that? <laughs> I've had those calls where friends are like, hey, I'm in jail. Can you, uh, you ever had that call? I've had that call, right? And, and this is like that call. Paul's saying, hey guys, I'm in jail. Now, they know Paul, right? They know he wasn't like robbing the, the donkey stand, right? He wasn't stealing sandals. He wasn't doing anything like that. He was preaching the gospel. But they're worried about him because preaching the gospel in those days was a dangerous thing. And so they're concerned about him. And he's saying, hey guys, i let you know I'm in jail and here's the things that I'm going through. But, but, but guys, I don't want you to be freaked out, okay? I don't want you to worry too much about me. Because now, if there was anything that Paul wanted to change in his life, chances are, 
at that moment, he didn't want to be a prisoner, right? He wanted his freedom, I'm sure. He wanted to be able to go freely and preach the gospel wherever he wanted. But Paul is one to make the best of a situation. And I, and I want to ask all of you a question today. I want you to think about this and be honest about this. How many of you right now in your life have something that's going on in your life that you wish was different, right? Right now there's something that you're just like, like man, I just wish God would change this thing in my life, right? I just wish this was different. Chances are, I think the reality is, almost every single one of us here today, all of us have something when we look at our lives, we go, yeah, I kind of wish it wasn't like that, right? Paul was like, yeah, I kind of wish I wasn't in chains, right? We're all, we're all like, there's something going on in my life. I, I wish this wasn't that way, right? I mean, when you're young, you want to be older, right? And when you're old, you want to be younger, right? Isn't that how it works? That's kind of strange, but I wish I was younger. I wish I was older. At what age are you just happy? I don't know. Or maybe it's your job. You're like, oh, I just wish this was different. Right? I wish I didn't have this challenge. I wish I didn't have this person I had to work with. I, I, I wish it was different. Right? We all have those things that we struggle with. Maybe, maybe you're like, oh, I wish I was married. Maybe you're like, oh, I wish I wasn't married. <laughs> well, well, let's be honest, right? Marriages work. Sometimes we feel that way. There's things in our lives we wish were different. Things we wish that they weren't that way. Here's three thoughts for you. You can write them down if you'd like to. Three thoughts if you're taking notes. First is this. We all have a want. Or we all have a what. Sorry, let me try that again. My brain's not on quite yet. We all have a what. The word what. We all have a what, but we don't understand the why that goes with it. There's a what. This is what's going on in my life, right? The what. This is the thing. This is the what that's happening right now. What's up, right? And I don't understand why it's not different. God, why? Why, God? God, why is it like this in my life, God? God, I don't want to deal with this health problem. I don't want to struggle with these finances. I don't want to struggle with this relationship. Why, God? We know what the what is. Uh, We don't understand the why. You know what I'm talking about, right? At different seasons in our lives, all of us have those what's. Those what's that we don't understand the why's for. And we have to remember something incredibly important in those seasons of our lives, that God always has a why behind that what. And I love that. God always has a why. God is not a God who wastes our experiences. God is not a God who wastes even our hurts, frankly. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He is good through and through. He's in control. And he can take what the enemy meant for evil, and our God is so good that he can turn that attack into something that is good. He can make a trial that's something that punishing us we feel like, and he can take that and turn that into a character-building experience, right? And he can build our faith if we work with him in those difficult times. God is working in all things to bring about good, Scripture tells us. God has a why in the what that we don't understand. Another thought if you're taking notes is this. I don't have to understand the why in order to trust God with the what. I can trust the Lord with all of my heart and lean not on my own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge that He is the one guiding my path. That he is the one who will make my path straight, as Scripture tells us, right? I don't have to understand everything to continue trusting in God. That's important. Because a lot of times, we're kind of fumbling in the dark, aren't we? 
I don't know about you, but God doesn't like email me on Monday morning with the path that my week is about to take, right? It sure would be easy if, if, if I just had the God app and he would just put things in my calendar for me, right? And say, okay, here, here's how the week's going. Here, this, this is what's going to happen. Look forward to that or don't look forward to that, but here it comes either way. He's God. He can do that. God doesn't give me those sorts of things, not even as a pastor, right? And if I can't get the God app, well, you guys are out of luck, <laughs> right? I'm kidding. But I don't, I don't have the God app, so we're clear, right? But I don't have to understand. I don't have to understand everything to continue trusting God. That's hard. It's hard because we want to be in control. We want to know. I want to use Google Maps to know where I'm going everywhere, right? And when my GPS leads me wrong, you ever yelled at your phone? Yeah. 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 We just had this happen yesterday. My wife and I were traveling to the same place in the Twin Cities, and her phone routed her a goofy way. She's like, my phone, I'm sorry, it took me longer to get here because my phone took me this silly, out-of-the-way way. And I added like five miles to her trip, and it was only like a five-mile drive, so, you know, that's... <laughs> That's adding, I mean, that wasn't her fault. She was following the GPS. You, you yell at your phone and you look kind of silly in traffic as you're doing it, I suppose. But we want to be in control. We want to know the path. We want to know where we're going. We want to we have that. But the truth of the matter is, folks, we, we don't have to understand everything in order to continue to trust God. And maybe you're in a place right now going... I don't like this thing that's going on in my life. I wish this was different, and I'm not sure what to do about it, frankly. Right? That's a struggle for all of us at some point. And I want to give you two questions to ask when life is hard. The first question, and you're going to be tempted here, the first question to ask, that you want to ask, is why God, right? That's the one we want to ask. Why me? Why now? Why this? Why God? But I'm going to encourage you to bounce over that why God kind of question and instead ask this. I want to encourage you to ask this, in fact. Instead of asking God why, ask God, now what? I don't mean that in a sarcastic way. But now what, God? <coughs> Excuse me. God, I, I, I don't like what's going on here, God. I don't like this situation. I don't like this event. I don't like this challenge, God. But I don't even understand it. But I trust you with the why, God. And what I want you to do, God, is show me. Show me what it is you want me to do here. Now what should I do in this situation, God? God, now that I've gotten this diagnosis... God, now that I, you know, my basement flooded and I've got this bill, God, now that my car broke down, God, now that my kid did this, not why, God, but now what? Now what do you want me to do? And we see this happening in verse 12, if you're following in Philippians. Paul says this to the people in Philippi. He says, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me Oh, it looks bad here, folks. But it's really served to what? If you're following along, Paul says, despite my being chained here, despite all this bad stuff that's happened to me, despite my not having my freedom, despite my not being in control, my not getting to have my way, what does it really serve to do, Paul says? Paul says it's really served to advance the gospel. Right? Right? Now this word advance, if you dig into that in the Greek, it's translated as advance in English. It's, it's really a military term that means to move forward, right? To move forward a, a, a group of troops, uh, most likely in, in, in attack, but not always in attack. It can be to move forward. You know, there's, there's people who've got to go sometimes even before the troops to clear the way. There's now special machinery for it. But, you know, there's, there's people who've got to lead the way. Go clear the underbrush or whatever it is they need to do. And Paul is saying, while it looks bad, God is actually doing something. We're going through this, 
But while we're going through this, we're going to advance the gospel. Paul says, despite what is happening to me, folks, because remember, he knows they're going to be worried he's in jail. Despite my being chained, God is using this to advance the gospel. Now, a lot of times, I know, you, as this happens to us, you're going to be in a place and you're going to go like, oh man, this isn't good. I don't see God working in this. How is God working in my cancer? Right? How is God working in this catastrophe? How is God working in this mess? I don't see his presence. I don't feel his presence. I, I feel like I'm lost and I'm alone. How can anything good come of this? Sometimes we feel that way, don't we? And I want to encourage you to stop at that moment and have a change of perspective and realize that our God is big enough. And in fact, our God even specializes in working through things that we don't even understand. We serve a God who can turn what we call obstacles into divine opportunities for him to show himself. We serve a God that can take setbacks, or what we would call setbacks, and he can actually turn them into setups for him to be glorified and for us to make a difference. We could say it this way. You may feel like you're in prison, but your prison can become your pulpit. That's what happened for Paul, right? Paul could have been like, oh man, I'm tied down, I'm stuck with these dirty, rotten soldiers. They don't love Jesus. Mumble, grumble, gnashing of teeth, wailing, pulling, you know, sackcloth and ashes like in the Old Testament, right? He could have done that. Is that what he did? No, we know that. He turns his prison into a pulpit. In other words, there could be a purpose in your problem. You ever think of it that way? There could be a purpose in your problem. In fact, there probably is. What the enemy meant for evil, God can actually use for good in the middle of things that you would never choose. Right? God specializes in using those things for his glory. Your prison can become a pulpit where you get to share God's love in the midst of things that aren't the way you'd like them to be. There's a purpose in your prison. You may not see it, But God can give you a different perspective. God may have a purpose in the middle of your mess if you will just look with spiritual eyes for it. We can ask, God, what is it that you want to do through this? What, God? What, God, are you doing? What, where are we going? How can I get there with you, Lord? Rather than, why me? Why now? Why this? What do you want to do in me, Lord? What do you want to do through me, Lord? Even though I didn't choose this, how can I bring you glory anyhow? I don't understand this, God, but I trust you with the why, Lord. Now what? Now what do you want to do with me? Moving to verse 13. We'll see the story come to life here. Verse 13 says this, As a a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Right? Paul says, everybody knows why I'm here. Everybody knows. They don't think I'm here for doing something wrong. They know why I'm here. I'm here because I've been proclaiming the gospel. Now, now, if you're, you're reading along, you're going, hold on a minute. They're punishing you, Paul. This isn't a good thing, right? Paul, maybe you should just be quiet for a little while and see if they let you out soon, you know, for good behavior. Right? The prison my dad runs, if, you, if you're not a knucklehead, if you behave yourself, and, and you're a short timer, not a long timer, you can actually cut some time off of your sentence by behaving, right? By being good. And and your natural inclination might be like, Paul, you know, just keep quiet and maybe they'll let you go. Because that's, I mean, really what they were after. They wanted him to shut up. They wanted him to quit preaching the gospel. But Paul was unwilling. And Paul 
leans into it, in fact. Paul never wanted to go to Rome as a prisoner. He wanted to go as a preacher. But here in that situation, you know what God did for Paul? Paul brought him a bunch of people who didn't know Jesus. And in the system that the Romans used, four times a day, Paul would get new guards. He was chained up 24 hours a day. He was chained up while he was sleeping. So four different men a day would come into Paul. God brought them to him. Four different men every day Paul got to witness to. Paul got to share the gospel with them. Paul got to convert them. Paul got to tell them about Jesus, right? As you're reading the story, you're almost thinking, which one of these guys is actually the prisoner here? Who's chained to who? Right? Paul's like, you're going to chain me to somebody, boy. I'm bringing him on my team. That's a salesman, right? So Paul starts converting the guys. When Satan attacks you, you take the power of God and, and what Satan meant for evil and find something that God can do with it. I mean, some of you right now are going through things. I, I know some of your lives. Things that are difficult, right? And I want you to know that the test that you endure today could be your testimony tomorrow. Right? I want you to hear that. The test that you are going through today, that challenge, that struggle, that approached properly, tomorrow can be your testimony. Tomorrow can be a witness to the greatness of God working in your lives. Verse 14, Paul says this. He says, Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged. <clears throat> you see that? Paul says, because I'm chained up. In fact, all the other guys are now encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and more fearlessly. Right? I mean, our natural inclination is our buddy gets arrested for doing something. We're like, oh, I'm not doing that then. But Paul's pals, they see him get arrested and they're like, all right, I'm doing that even better. Right? He's preaching the gospel. Now I'm really going to preach the gospel. Maybe I can get chained up and get some guys just like Paul and start converting people that way. We'll, we'll start a prison ministry from the inside. Right? That's what Paul did. First prison ministry. That was Paul. And so this question that we need to learn to ask is so what? Right? There was some division in the church that Paul wants to address in verse 15, and he talks about it. He says, it's true. Paul says, it's true that there's some people preaching Christ out of envy. They're preaching Christ out of rivalry. But there are others who are preaching it out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here in chains, that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. But the former, they're preaching Christ out of selfish ambition, he says. Not sincerely, supposing that they might stir up some trouble for me while I'm in chains. You know, I'm not there to defend it. They're trying to cause a ruckus. But then in verse 18, he asks the question. He says, so what, basically? Paul says, but what does it matter? He says, the most important thing that in every way, whether it comes from false motives or true, is that Christ is being proclaimed, that Christ is being preached. Paul says, that, folks, is what is important. The most important thing. He says, so what if they're preaching out of selfish ambition? So what if their motives are wrong? If they're preaching the truth, so what? To the glory be God. Christ being preached, giving God the glory, that is what matters. Sometimes we get to a place in life, right, where there are some things that are bothering us, some things that we just have to learn and say, so what? So what? What does that, what does that really matter? So this is something I've slowly been trying to train myself to do, trying to learn. It doesn't always work. But when something's irritating me, when something's bothering me, I try to ask myself this so what question. Is this, is this problem going to matter a hundred years from now? If not, well, then so what, right? In fact, a lot of times when we ask ourselves this question, 
is this problem even going to bother me a month from now, right? Is this problem even going to bother me a week from now? In fact, a lot of the things we see as problems in our life, it's not even going to bother me tomorrow. But we get so blinded by the problem that's immediately in front of us, we get so distracted by it, we get so angry at it, so frustrated by it, so, so down from it, that it steals our joy. When all we have to do is say, so what? A week, a month, a year, a hundred years from now, that isn't going to matter. So what? We need to have a little bit more of that in our lives. We talk about this with my son a lot. He's seven, and he's learning about what are the big problems in life and what are the little problems in life. We've put it on a numerical scale. Is this a five problem? Is the house on fire? Right? Or is this a, little, a one problem, a two problem, a three problem, a four problem? And we should respond accordingly, right? A lot of our problems in life that we see as fives, they're not fives. Right? We want to pretend they're fives. We want to complain to our friends like they're fives. But they're not fives. There's very few fives, in fact. So what? Let those little things go. Don't let them be a distraction. Don't let them take your focus off the goodness of God and how God can work in that situation through you. When you identify something that just isn't that big of a deal, it changes your perspective. And suddenly you can focus on what really matters, right? So we don't get wrapped up in the mundane things. So we don't get wrapped up in the trivial things. So that instead we can focus on the things that are eternal. When you recognize what doesn't matter, you can focus then instead on what does matter. Does that make sense? If you can identify this doesn't matter, so what? You can focus on the things that do matter. What matters? Well, God matters, right? That's something to focus on. God matters. Eternity matters. Serving people matters. Using our gifts matters. Making a difference in this world by using our gifts matters. And when we see that with a new perspective, that frees us up totally and completely. That's why Paul could make this statement, and it's almost a mind-blowing statement. This is one of the, the, the most amazing statements made in the history of the world, in my opinion. Paul says this in Philippians 1.21. He says, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. How about that for an attitude, folks? In this Roman prison, where Paul, chained to his captor, is writing a love letter, a joy-filled letter to this church he started ten years before. He's awaiting trial to determine whether he's going to live or die. I mean, they're going to execute him. We know that's what happens. He knows that's among the possibilities, and it's a very real possibility, in fact. He's essentially locked up on death row. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whatever they do to me, Paul says, doesn't matter. If they let me live, I'm going to preach the gospel. If they kill me, I'm going to be with Jesus. Right? And that's the attitude that he has. And when you have that perspective in your own life, all of the things that tend to weigh us down, all of those things that don't really actually matter that much, begin to dissolve away with that new perspective as our focus. We all have a what that we don't understand. The why for, right? Why is it going on in my life this way, Lord? But the good news is that God always has a reason for it. There is always a why behind the what. We don't have to understand it to put our trust in God. That is a big, big deal. And then we have to ask, now what, God? How can we use this for your glory? How do you want to use me in this situation? What do you want me to do as I go through this? Even though this isn't a thing of my choosing, Lord, I'm going to lean into it. And I'm going to do it to your glory. To live as Christ 
and to die is gain. Hey, the worst thing Paul says they can do is kill me. And that isn't a bad thing at all. In fact, Paul sees it as a desirable outcome. How's that for you for an attitude? So all of us can learn from this. All of us can change our perspective. And even in the worst of what Satan might bring, God can turn it and to bring joy in it and to use it for his glory. Change our perspectives and it changes everything. Amen. Let's pray.